Hi there and welcome to the second revision webinar this week on the challenge of natural hazards. My name is Karen, I work for Discover the World Education. Some of you were with me last night um, looking at the theory behind plate tectonics, looking at natural hazards um, and stuff like that. Um, tonight we're going to look at Iceland as a case study for volcanoes, specifically the Eyjafjallajökull 2010 eruption. We're also going to look at how Iceland monitors, predicts protects, looking at the plans and the risks of um, tectonic hazards, um, why people still continue to live in Iceland despite those challenges. I've tried to put in as much information in this session as you can, or as, a, as I can, so that you have sort of like every opportunity to have lots of different facts, figures, data, statistics and information to expand your case study knowledge um, and to be able to really use those examples and apply them in your answers. There's plenty of opportunities to see where you can really think like geographers and write like geographers. As always, please ask any relevant questions that you have in the chat function. Can I please stress that you keep those questions relevant to the webinar um, and also appropriate at all times, please. I'm just going to turn the video off so that you can actually see um, the slides as a whole. But as you can see, I'm still here. So let's move on then. So. We've looked at these, um, what it means to think like a geographer. This is really where you're looking at applying your knowledge, looking at things from a social, physical, political, environmental, as well as sort of like an economical point of view and putting everything together and applying it in your answers. And to write like a geographer is really talking about using those key terms, those key words, using them effectively, effectively and efficiently in your answers. We're going to look at primary and secondary effects today, the immediate and long-term responses to a volcanic hazard, how monitoring, prediction, protection and planning can reduce the risks from a tectonic hazard, and also the reasons why people continue to live in an area of tectonic activity. Our webinar today is really focused on Iceland, and there is much academic evidence to support the fact that if you have some generic background knowledge of a country in terms of its physical and social uniqueness, you'll be able to understand and reinforce more fully the different case study. So I just want to give you a little bit of information and background on Iceland. So Iceland is one of the only places on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that is above the Atlantic Ocean. So in other words, you can see it. The Mid-Atlantic Mid Ridge is the longest sub-ocean mountain range on Earth, and it shows a constructive or a divergent plate margin in its simplest form. OK, and if you look at this diagram, this really explains this divergent boundary, the spreading of plates. OK, and then you've got the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in the middle. The Eurasian plate is moving away from the North American plate. Along this boundary, there are ridges, mountains, and where magma fills the gap and has built up over time, there are also volcanoes. The plates here are moving apart very, very slowly, between two and four centimetres every year. In addition to that, Iceland is in the unique situation of having a magma chamber and a hot spot underneath it. The crust here is very thin, which means it is also a hot spot area. So it's got a combination of this divergent plate boundary and a hot spot. There are over 200 volcanoes in Iceland and 33 of them are active. So the challenge of living with tectonic hazards is very evident and very, very real. So as I said, 33 of Iceland's volcanoes are currently considered active. To add to this and to develop and extend the risk even further, around a third of these volcanoes are buried under glacial ice. Iceland is known, you probably know, as the land of fire and ice, and it's this combination of volcanoes and glaciers that actually gives it its name. 
The combination of a volcanic eruption under a glacier produces a distinct natural hazard called a Yerklaup, which is actually spelt J and then O-K-U-L and then H-A-U-P-S. And they are high magnitude glacial floods, which means they are absolutely massive. The risk in Iceland of Jöklaups is actually very high and is considered by the Icelandic people and by sort of geologists and tectonic sort of researchers like myself, that the risk is actually greater than the volcanic activity itself. If you want to do some extended reading on Jöklaups and Iceland and the risk of the sort of like the glaciers combined with the volcanoes, there's a fantastic article by Fiona Tweed in the Icelandic um, volume of the GA magazine and it's autumn 2019. So it's just this time last year, fantastic article about sort of like Iceland, Jöklaups, the volcanic activity linked in with the high magnitude glacier floods and glaciers. So we've looked at the physical side of Iceland and I now want to look very briefly at the population of Iceland. And if we are to think like geographers and fully understand the challenge of living with natural hazards, we have to put the population at the centre of any case study. Iceland is around about 44,000 mi 44, square miles in size. It's about the size of Ireland, 103,000 square kilometres. But it has a population of around 350,000, the same as Croydon, Nottingham and Gdansk in Poland. So sort of three big town stroke cities and the whole of Iceland has a similar population. 78% of the population live within this red circle here, okay, so the very southwest corner, which is where actually the capital of Reykjavik is. So around about 95% of Iceland, um, you know, the people live sort of like in that very small area there. So 78% in the southwest corner and 95% within that red circle. It's just sort of like quite a, you know, a, a distinct population situation. Iceland is very, very sparsely populated, less than three kilometres per, sorry, less than three people per square kilometres. It's the most sparsely populated country in Europe. So let's now look at Eyjafjallajökull Jökull and the eruption that happened in 2010 as a more detailed case study. It's important that we know and understand the primary and secondary effects, plus the immediate and long term responses. And we're going to break this down to enable you to see how you can think like geographers and look at the different aspects. So let's first of all look at the economic costs of the eruption. So the airlines lost £130 million per day due to the stoppage of the flights. And the tourism lost between five and six million pounds a day as well because people could not travel, rather like the situation that we're in now. OK, other transport companies were actually able to benefit. So, for example, Eurostar saw a massive increase because people couldn't fly and people had to get to and from Europe from the UK. Then actually they saw an extra 50,000 passengers just in those six days traveling on their trains. Let's look at the bigger effects here and probably some facts that you didn't know about. The Japanese car manufacturer Nissan actually halted production of several models for one day because it couldn't import parts. So you, although that does seem like quite a small fact, that would have really impacted how many vehicles they could actually produce at that particular time. And as a result of staff being stranded abroad, meetings were cancelled, there were delays to um, transit, to, to sort of like produce, to freight, and many businesses worldwide actually lost money. If we look at the environmental impact, so slightly different impact, the ash was deposited into the North Atlantic. And some of that was actually contained iron, which actually triggered a plankton bloom actually in the Atlantic. 
In addition to that, the grounding of the European flights prevented the emission of some 2.8 million tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So that could be seen as a positive impact. Okay, The eruption on the 14th of April, because there were several eruptions before, set off a major flood in Iceland. And when erupted lava partly melted a glacier, prompting authorities, they actually had to get sort of like 700 people evacuated. So the flood is the environmental impact, which then had an impact on the people because they then had to evacuate. And then if we look at the social impacts, okay, the people in the rural areas downwind of the volcano had to wear goggles and face masks as the ash was so thick. 500 cattle farmers and their families had to be evacuated from the surrounding area just by the volcano. Okay, some of the roads were shut down. As you can see there, the flooding there actually washed away some of the roads and bridges. And I was in a very fortunate position to be able to visit Iceland in the July of 2010. And on several of our journeys past the volcano, we actually had to go on temporary bridges while they fixed the bridges. There's only one main road in Iceland. Um, so, you know, if that one is damaged, it does cause a real issue. And the ash contaminated the local water supplies. I know some of the hydroelectric power plants were actually damaged and there was too much ash going through the water. So that then became a problem as well. I've got a question in the box, which is very relevant. It said, does that mean some volcanoes are good for the environment? And I would say, yes, they are. Um, because if you think about sort of like the reduction um, it, it's sort of like a secondary impact, isn't it? You've got a reduction of flights, which brings down the carbon dioxide, but also the ash can affect the environment in terms of making the soil a little bit fertile. And we do know about that maybe in places like Italy. We are going to look at soil a little bit um, later on. But yeah, sometimes volcanoes are good for the environment. OK, so let's move on um, from the social impact. And we're now going to look at some reflections sort of 10 years on. So this is where we look at the long term impacts and what we have learned 10 years on. Sometimes we need to take time after a case study to reflect on and to see how things can be changed and altered for the future, but also what some of those long term impacts have actually been. Now, due to the global impact, much research and action has been conducted on Air Fleckley Yerkel. The four main areas that I'm going to focus on tonight are the aviation industry and international trade, the Icelandic economy, the farming communities in Iceland, and then looking at monitoring and preparation for future events. So, in terms of the aviation and international trade, it probably was the greatest impact and the one that maybe your parents, your teachers, your grandparents will remember from the actual eruption. Over 100,000 flights were cancelled and in excess of 10 million passengers were affected. But the impacts were really felt worldwide. So even though this is a small island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and actually considered to be part of the European area, it really was felt in, you know, worldwide with millions of pounds, dollars and euros lost. Nothing like the current crisis, but actually many holiday makers had their holidays extended. I do know friends of mine who were teachers um, with me at the time. We, um, they were on holiday and they couldn't get back for something like 12 days. Very luckily, they were abroad in a very nice hotel, so they actually had an extended holiday. But I did have other friends who were completely stranded and actually had to hire a car to get back rather than using a plane. So their holidays could have been extended, some were stranded. There were rescue flights, rather like the situation we've had in the last few months. And at the time, there was a zero tolerance on flying in air affected by ash and we'll look at that in a minute because that has changed quite significantly since this eruption but it wasn't only the passengers that were affected it was also trade and perhaps this butterfly effect can be best illustrated by the impact felt by the Kenyan farmers 
And you kind of think, why did the Kenyan farmers get impacted by, you know, the ash and the lack of aeroplanes in the air? But it was estimated that they lost an average of three million dollars a day and some 3000 tons of fresh flowers were left to rot. And this really shows how far away places can be adversely affected in our ever globalised, interconnected world and the fragility of the aviation industry to volcanic ash cloud events. These flowers couldn't be transported to Europe or the UK, so therefore they were left to rot. And, you know, so it really did impact on this on this area. If you want to look a little bit more on that, there's a little YouTube clip there which you can either screenshot or take um, a picture of. Um, but also our webinar will actually be available on our website and on the YouTube channel afterwards so you can quickly slip through um, and look at those different links that I've put on there for you. There's six or seven extra links that you can take a look at. There was plenty of criticism actually on the Civil Aviation Authority for closing airspace. Everybody said, why do you need to close the airspace? Why can't the aeroplanes fly through the ash? And it was because previous research and evidence had shown that it was quite dangerous for aeroplanes to fly through air that was affected by ash. But after the 2010 eruption, actually, engineers, volcanologists and modelers actually worked very closely together in a collaboration to learn more about hazardous airspace in relation to volcanic ash. And this research actually focused on three areas, looking at the engine design, looking at sort of like quantifying the levels of ash concentration to see what was safe and what wasn't. And then looking at different meteorological forecasting to see where the ash was going to go. And each of these areas all present their own challenge, but they have to be sort of like closely connected together in order to make sure that we are able to fly safely through areas affected by ash. So the Civil Aviation Authority has made some changes since the 2010 eruption, and it now allows more flexibility on flights in ash affected areas. Airlines are now able to fly in areas that are less than two milligram, two milligrams sorry, per cubic meter just for a short period of time. So they can't fly for sort of like four hours through this concentration of ash, but they can fly through sort of like maybe a short amount of time. OK, in situation where concentrations are higher, that then needs to be referred and they need to look at lots more detail in order to deem it safe that the plane can go through. The CAA have actually produced very clear guidance for airlines in the event of the next volcanic activity. And I'm sure there will be one. It's not a case of if, it is a case of when. And this guidance was really put to the test in 2011 when another volcano called Grimsburton, that's another Icelandic ash volcano that erupted in 2011, so just a year later. But we really didn't hear about this. It actually produced more ash than the Eyjafjallajökull yerkel eruption, but because the wind was in a different direction and there was a lower ash density and concentration, only 1% of flights were actually affected. So we actually didn't hear about it. Global monitoring of volcanoes is now split into nine key sites across the globe. And you will see from this map that the Iceland volcanoes are generally monitored by the London site. And these centres provide information to the airlines based on the allowances permitted by the Civil Airline Authority. This vital monitoring and tracking keeps the air traffic superhighways moving as much as possible, particularly in high risk areas. And I'm going to show you the image of the um, air traffic superhighways. So these lines on this map show you where the airlines tend to fly. You can see there's quite a heavy sort of concentration of air traffic over the USA, in between the USA and Europe. You see European airspace is just, you, you can hardly see through the lines here. So it just shows you how busy sort of like European airspace and that link over the Atlantic actually is. And when you consider that you've got a volcanic island in the middle of the Atlantic, this is something that we really need to consider. You can also see quite clearly here the Pacific Ring of Fire where the red sort of like areas are. And these are frequent ash producing eruptions. And again, they need to be very, very closely monitored to make sure that airlines and the air routes um, 
are sort of like looked at and that it is monitored and the preparation and the assessments of the risk so that the risk actually is minimised. I think that's a really fantastic map um, as a geographer for us to look at and to analyse. Um, yeah, and it really does sort of like show to us how airlines and air routes are, are really sort of like connecting our world now. Okay, so the let's move on from air, the aviation and trade and let's look at tourism. The 2010 eruption put Iceland firmly on the map as global news reported on the volcano and its impact and indirectly the spectacular landscapes were suddenly shown all over the world. It showed everything that Iceland has to offer and it really captured the interest. Actually the pronunciation of Eiflik Jörkel also sort of like captured the interest and, it, and if you go on to some of the YouTube clips about sort of like people trying to pronounce this unpronounceable volcano it really got the world talking it really went as far as sort of like Asia and Australia and America as well as Europe because everybody was impacted by this because of the flights or knew somebody that was impacted so it really did make global news. After then, tourist numbers started to rise quite significantly. Journalists started going to the island, holiday companies increased their portfolio to include the area, and it became very, very Instagrammable. And we know that the rise in social media can have a huge impact on anything. The Icelandic Tourist Board took complete advantage of the situation and they launched a very successful marketing campaign which is called Inspired by Iceland and their tagline was Iceland has never been more awake and there has never been more an exciting time to visit the country. So they're basically talking about this sort of like unique erupting volcano that was now awake um, but they were basically saying come on come and see it have something special you know let, let find something very positive and turning it from a negative um, event. Again, you can take a look at their campaign video. It's very quirky. It's very Icelandic. It will make you smile and it will really show you some of the amazing landscapes in Iceland as well. So tourism has really exploded and over the few years from 2010, right the way through, you can see from this graph, um, right the way through until 2018, there were significant increases in tourism. The reason why we can look at this in geographers and sort of say, well, hang on, you know, was it social media? Was it other reasons? Or was it A. Fleckley-Yerkel that actually caused this? But the, the evidence is quite clear from this graph, I think, because from 2010, it started to really increase. But then around about nine years after the event, the numbers started to drop off, okay? In, um, you know, in 2018, they had over 2 million people visited Iceland. The numbers started to drop in 2019. And I'm sure that had we not have had the travel restrictions in place for 2020, we would have also seen a further sort of like plateauing or decline in tourism. I just wanted to show you some more data on Iceland's economy, as it clearly shows the proportion of Iceland's economy and how it has shifted in the last eight years. In 2017, over 45% of Iceland's exports were from within the tourism sector and around about 13% of the workers are employed within this sector. And this is quite significant now, actually, because tourism is pretty much at a, a zero um, at the current time. And it is proving quite a difficulty for um, Iceland because they are quite dependent now on tourism and the money that it brings into the country. So as critical thinkers and learners, we do need to consider other aspects which could have triggered this surge in tourism, for example. And if we look at these sort of like six reasons, these things all happened within the last eight years. So yes, we had the Air Fleckley-Yerkla um, volcanic eruption. We then had more airlines traveling. They started using um, Iceland for Game of Thrones. Um, Justin Bieber used it quite heavily in some of his music videos. Oblivion, Prometheus, Star Wars. Um, they all started using Iceland as a, a film set, actually. Um, the exchange rate was better, which meant it was slightly cheaper. We also had this marketing campaign and the rise of social media. But if you look at the graphical evidence, it is quite clear that 
you know, this all started from the volcanic eruption. So therefore the fact that they used it as a film location was probably because they saw it on um, the news of the volcanic eruption. People wanted to go there. So there was more demand for flights because of the volcanic eruption, okay? So as critical thinkers, we need to think about that, but it does all go back to that 2010 eruption. So let's move on to another area of Iceland's economy, which is very important, farming. Iceland, due to its global location and climate, has a very short growing season. And the 2010 eruption occurred at the beginning of the lambing season and at a time when crops were just beginning to grow. Ash ball had serious consequences, making livestock grazing almost impossible. Most farmers housed their livestock during the ash fall and for some time after, but this was pretty difficult because if you can imagine in farming, your livestock can sometimes triple because many of the sheep actually have twins. So, you know, all of a sudden you're having to house an awful lot more animals. Farmers were also concerned about the effect on the hay. The pastures were cut slightly higher to avoid getting ash in the hay and over 30% of the normal harvest was lost, which meant that they had a shortage of food supplies in the winter. The emergency relief fund did compensate the farmers, um, but they were not involved or included in the emergency planning. And there is still a lot of people, the farming community and residents, actually calling for greater inclusion to protect the livelihood of farmers, because farmers are central to every country's economy and need to be informed and reassured for the future. So let's look at the lessons learned before we move on um, to our next part of the webinar. So the Eoflecli Yerkel was a really useful trial because it is considered that Eoflecli Yerkel was actually quite a small eruption. And there is another little volcano, I will say little, it's huge, called Katla, which has shown us historically that when Eoflecli Yerkel erupts, it's not long after that Katla erupts. And Katla is a volcano that's around about three to four times the size of Eoflecli Yerkel. The 2010 eruption showed us that we need to look at all different hazards. We mustn't just look at Yerklaups in terms of that magnitude floods. We also need to look at sort of like how local communities are affected, how the world is affected, how the airlines are affected, how our sort of like, you know, reliance on sort of transport and interlinking is affected. And 10 years on, because of the collaboration that Iceland has had with Europe and the rest of the world, actually, as a world, we are in a more resilient position to manage any future eruptive events. So let's look at that. Following the 2010 eruption, an um, uh, organisation was set up called Future Volk. OK, and this is a collaboration with Europe and Iceland, which is a monitoring system and a network for the future. It's a very advanced monitoring system um, and it collects information and data. And it's a communication sort of like um, system, which basically tells everybody what is going on, how we can react um, and just tell people everything that they need to know. So let's look at their aims. So their main objective and aims is to establish an integrated monitoring system, working together. It's really important that with something like this that affects the world, that lots of different sort of groups come together. It's the use of real scientific technology and research. Um, and then that looks at the civil protection, the different authorities, um, the monitoring, the meteorological systems, maybe the civil defence, and not just in Iceland, but actually right the way across the world. They use different things like gas stations, they monitor movement, they use GPS and seismic systems, they scan, they watch whether the land is moving, because with magma, it can actually push the land up slightly before there is a particular eruption. They monitor the gas and the chemicals and the minerals in the water to actually look and see what's going on. It's a really, really forward thinking, amazing system that actually will really help us in the future. 
It has considerably improved the information that Iceland and the rest of the world provides. It's clear, it's straightforward, and it's informative, okay? One of the things that they are able to do is to give information like this one, okay? There's a really good question in the chat box, and I'm going to come back to this once I've looked at this slide. OK, but this is the sort of information that the Icelandic authorities will provide residents and people who are living in Iceland or visiting Iceland, and it's available to everybody. So it is clear. It's in written form. It's in diagrammatic form. It also tells you sort of like information. For example, number six is a landslide. And this is where it's telling you that it is unstable ground that may slide in an earthquake. So it gives you enough information to be sort of like informed and it, it's clear. And I think the one thing that the last six or seven months has told us that all we want is clear, concise and digestible information. And that's exactly what Future Bulk and the Icelandic authorities are doing. Now, the question in the chat box is really, really good. And whoever asks this question, well done. You're really thinking like a geographer and, and, and which is brilliant. Why doesn't every disaster prone area have future folk? And you know what? Wouldn't it be great if everybody did? Now, this particular um, monitoring sort of system and organisation is heavily funded by the European authorities. So it's partly funded by the EU. We know that Iceland isn't in the EU, um, but it is considered to be part of that particular area. And um, the European sort of agencies really felt um, that it was so important because of what happened in 2010 to invest money, to invest sort of money into the research, into the scientific monitoring um, and into the way that it delivers the information. So they really felt that this was an important thing to do. And luckily they were able to fund it. How much notice can this provide? Um, I will come back to that question because um, we were recently in a situation where some information was given to the Icelandic people. And I'm going to show you that in the next couple of slides. Future Folk is sort of like looking a little bit long term. So they are looking at um, how we do things on an immediate thing, but also looking very long term. So um, really, it's all to do with data analyzing the data so that we can do better prediction as well. Um, so that's something that happens over time. But I'm going to um, come back to that over the next couple of slides. And then there's another question. So I'm going to continue with the questions that we're getting. Is there enough preparation and planning in somewhere like Iceland? Does that mean that the recovery can be quicker and less expensive? And I think the answer to that question is yes. I think if people are prepared and they know exactly what they need to do and we can evacuate areas a lot quicker and then there is a clear process afterwards, then yes, the recovery can be quicker and less expensive because perhaps the risk has been minimized. So therefore there is protection for the houses, for the people. Um, you know, for the farmers, I think that's really, really important. OK, so let's move on to the next slide. Fantastic questions, by the way, everyone. I think you're really thinking very sensibly and thinking around the topic as well, which is brilliant. Um, you know, we want you to be critical thinkers. We want you to challenge some of the information that you read and you hear about, because that is going to be fantastic for you in the, in the long run. OK, so this is some of the information and I would encourage you to go on to a website called vedur.is. But if you just Google Icelandic Met Office, it comes up and you can put in there, you can click on the link that says volcanoes and you can pull up any information on any volcano in Iceland. It will give you quite clear, concise, straightforward information. For example, it tells you what the aviation colour code is, so it's green. So that's what you will see if you're a, an aeroplane in your sort of like data that you've got in front of you. It will tell you the activity level. It will tell you when the last eruption was. And you can see from Katla here, I focused on Katla. It didn't, it hasn't erupted since 1918. But the activity level is high because they're, they are having a real heightened awareness of this particular volcano because it is considered that it, it is going to erupt soon. 
Um, so therefore they are really monitoring this particular volcano. It will give you information on what they're expecting to happen in the future. And I can see that one of the questions is, how can they ensure that they are accurate every time? I don't think they can ensure that they are accurate every time, but they really do look at history, what has happened before. They really do try and sort of like monitor everything and run data sort of examples and um, I can't think like a modeling process. Um, so hopefully they can get it as accurate as possible, but it's a little bit like the weather forecast that yeah, it's, it's accurate for a lot of the time, but obviously there are going to be slight differences in that because we are dealing with nature, unfortunately. So, or fortunately actually as geographers, but yeah, we can't ensure that they're gonna be accurate every time. So this government website is a collaboration between the Icelandic Meteorological Office, the University of Iceland and the government emergency team. And as you can see, it is clear, it is detailed information on every single volcano in Iceland. For those that have a heightened awareness, they're considered to be high risk. You also have these. Now, I know the resolution on this particular picture isn't great, but I just wanted to show you the kind of information that it gives. And this kind of shows what could possibly happen, the escape routes, where the emergency services are, where they think the floods and the lava flows and the ash flows and that sort of stuff are going to be. So there is quite clear guidance and this is also the emergency plan. You can see up the top right here the QR code, it's a bit like our track and trace system isn't it that we've got in place at the moment and anybody that is visiting these areas in Iceland is recommended that they scan this on the app 112 which is the emergency response app so that you know that you're in that particular area and then the search and rescue team should a volcanic eruption happen will know that you are there. Now, we're going back to a question about um, how much notice can this provide? Just earlier this year, actually, there was some quite significant movement on a volcanic activity in the Rakhens Peninsula. And an extinct volcano, one that actually hadn't erupted for about 1500 years, showed signs of movement and it actually had risen, the land had risen above the magma chamber by between two and four centimeters, which is quite a significant movement actually. So they were really worried about this. So the Icelandic authorities actually texted, sent a text to everybody that was in that area by looking at the mobile phone networks with quite clear instructions as to what to do, where to go, to go to the information meetings. And during those information meetings, they were then given information as to what to do, sort of like, should this particular volcano erupt? It was a really effective, efficient system. And it all happened within 24 hours. So it was really quite good sort of like notice really. And after speaking to some friends of mine who were in the area at the time, they felt that they were communicated effectively with, they were given information, and most importantly, they were completely informed. And that's what they wanted to be, actually. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in on some of this area so that you can see a little bit of, of more information. Um, so I've just taken some sort of screenshots of that one sort of like slide that you get. And as regular visitors to Iceland, and actually as an Icelandic guide, I always have the 112 app on my phone and I always sort of like scan in where I need to, because not only does it keep me up to date with tectonic activity alerts, it also lets me know if there's any other hazards going on. So for example, extreme weather, high winds, um, you know, rain and snow and, and all of that sort of stuff. So it's really important um, that we as, as visitors to Iceland keep on top of that. So I have another question in the box. So they have a very developed awareness and management for the people that are in areas that are more at risk of eruption. Yes, they do. They really do. And I think the Icelandic people are used to having natural hazards. They're used to having tectonic hazards. They, in terms of um, sort of natural hazards, they really do have climatic hazards as well. They have very strong winds. They quite often have very heavy rain, quite often have flooding. Um, and those people that live in tectonic 
risk areas are very, very aware that it is always there. OK, um, they know that the volcano is overdue. Um, they know if they live in an area of sort of like a, a floodplain. And the question there is, how can they predict from hundreds of years ago that a volcano erupts on such a date? They've looked at data over the last sort of like eight, nine hundred years. Um, so they've seen that generally when that one erupts, another one erupts. Um, and they can't be exact. They can't. It's impossible. Um, but you have to look at data and, and just sort of like, you know, make some assumptions that that could happen. And don't forget, they're monitoring for temperature. They're monitoring for magmatic movement. They're monitoring for tectonic movement. They're looking for the mineral content. They're looking for gas emissions. So there's lots of little data that they can put together. I want to introduce you to Julius. Um, he's a good friend of Discover the World Education, actually. And he lives in a little town called Vik. I'm going to show you Vik on here. So Vik on this particular map is here at the bottom. And as you can see, it is right on the flood area that it is anticipating that when Katla erupts and the flooding comes down. And he has grown up knowing that he lives in an area that is at risk of sort of like danger, particularly flooding. And these are his words, not mine. So Katla volcano is considered one of the most dangerous volcanoes in Iceland, potentially even the world. And due to its closeness to our beautiful town of Vik, every single home in Vik has an evacuation guide and we regularly have evacuation drills, rather like we have fire drills. This is all because historically a Katla eruption can seriously influence the people of Vik in a matter of 30 minutes and we need to be prepared. And he's holding up there the sign that he would put on his house to show how many people have been evacuated, what car they might have taken, the fact that they've taken a mobile phone, the fact that they've closed all the doors and when all of that sort of stuff is on there. And he has that sort of like by his front door, they know exactly where to go to this little church here that you can see there. Um, and his grandfather was actually caught up in the 1918 eruption. And he tells quite vivid stories um, that he told to Julius that Julius now tells us actually. Um, and you can see a little bit more of the YouTube clip there. We've got um, a question, which is a really good question. How early on can they spot factors that mean a volcano will erupt? I think that depends on the volcano. Sometimes it might be a buildup of two to three months. Sometimes it just might be a week. Sometimes it might sort of like be within a couple of days. So really, it just depends on the volcano. So I can't really give you a, a direct answer to that one. Um, with the one that was on the Rekens Peninsula, they were really monitoring the rise and fall of the magma chamber and actually it only happened sort of like for a few weeks and then it stopped. So everybody was put on alert and then nothing happened. Um, and a kind of, you know, the, the geography geeky people like me, probably, um, you know, may have been a little bit excited that a volcano was going to erupt because there is something exciting about nature um, happening right in front of you. But yeah, it, it didn't happen. So everybody was put an alert and then it went quiet again. So, so I can't really answer that question because it just depends. OK, let's move on um, just a little bit and look at why people still live in Iceland. And you may have heard of this chap. His name is Magnus Magnusson. He used to run Mastermind, actually. He lived in the UK, but he was Icelandic. And he very clearly in one of his books states that when you live in a country which moves alarmingly under your feet every five years or so with an earthquake or a volcanic eruption, you face like the saga heroes of old, they love their sagas, a choice of two courses of action. Either of them is good either flee the country and all its hazards or to stay and brave them out. And actually for more than 1100 years, the people of Iceland have chosen to stay and brave them out. So they are used to it and they adapt to it and they live with it. They work with the environment and the nature. They respect it, which is the most important thing. 
But there are some reasons as to why it is a good thing to live in Iceland, the geothermal energy. Iceland has been harnessing geothermal energy since 1907. They have five major geothermal plants, which produce 30% of the country's electricity and 87% of the country's hot water. The rest of the electricity actually comes from hydroelectric power. And here we have the Hecklisch-Hady geothermal power plant, the largest power plant in Iceland and the sixth largest in the world. It's considered to be very, very advanced technology and the skills and technologies incorporated by engineers and scientists in Iceland are now being shared around the world. Globalization at its best, sharing skills and ideas around the world. And this particularly happening in some um, geothermal LICs like Indonesia. Geothermal energy is very cost effective, it's sustainable, it's renewable. The average price per month for hot water and electricity in Iceland is £17. And if I compare that to the average price in the UK, which is £200. So it just shows you how cost effective it is. Geothermal and its development and accessibility has enabled other industries to develop. For example, aluminium and the combined sort of like geothermal energy and hydroelectric power actually has meant that aluminium is sort of like massive in Iceland. There's a couple of videos here that you can watch. Now, geothermal power plants, we just had a question, how do they work? Basically what they do is they use hot, they take hot water and they pump it down into the ground around about two to three kilometers down. It is then superheated by the geothermal energy. So by the sort of like the molten rock, the magma that's quite close to the crust in this particular area, it's superheated and the steam then goes shooting through a turbine which generates electricity, okay? And then in terms of the hot water, that then, the hot water then goes through sort of like a different way, all right? So geothermal energy is actually the steam from the superheated hot water that generates the turbines that produces the electricity. So I hope that's answered that particular question. If you want to know more about it, these two YouTube clips are brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and it will give you loads and loads of information on um, geothermal energy. Okay, then we've got farming. Okay, now farming, as we've already said, is a central part to Iceland being quite independent and sustainable. And we automatically think as geographers, oh, okay, volcanic areas, fertile soils. We mentioned that right at the beginning, didn't we, with Italy. However, this is slightly the case in Iceland, as it, but it is very, very new geologically. So therefore the soils here are very new and often quite thin, all right? So it's not really the fertile soils that have actually generated or improved the farming in Iceland. It's actually the geothermal energy that's impacted the farming in Iceland. And with the development of new technologies, farmers have been able to harness the power. And there are now a significant number of greenhouse areas in Iceland. And these farmers are able to grow tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, which they call paprika, strawberries and mushrooms, all year round, okay? So bearing in mind they have a very short growing season because obviously of where they are, near enough in the Arctic Circle, the fact that they're able to grow tomatoes in December, January, February is unbelievable. Some years Iceland is not only able to meet the full domestic demand for tomatoes, so those demands from sort of like the Icelandic countries, but they've also had enough to export to other Nordic countries. And 90% of the domestic demand of mushrooms and strawberries is now also met just by Icelandic sources. So it's unbelievable. Um, question here, why are the soils so good? It's all to do with the minerals which come out of the magma. So if you were with me yesterday, we were talking about all the different minerals that are within molten rock. That is added to the soil and it actually improves the fertility of the soil. In addition to that, the water obviously flows through the lava fields and it absorbs quite a lot of those minerals. So therefore, when the water then flows through the soil, that can improve the facility, the fertility as well. Now, as I said, in Iceland, whilst the soils are quite fertile, they're actually quite new. So therefore, they're not that great 
um, for farming. And I'm going to move on to that in two slides time, actually, just to show you what they're like. But I hope that that has answered that question. I'm going to really extend your knowledge now and look at afforestation because you may think, why is afforestation relevant in somewhere like Iceland when you've got sort of geothermal energy and, and stuff like that? But in order to really think like geographers and show your complete understanding and knowledge, it's imperative that you sometimes go slightly off piste and use examples and evidence that is not often found in your standard textbook. I often talk to my students when I was a teacher um, that I wanted, when I was an examiner actually, um, to, to read a question that really showed the X factor. She really showed something slightly different than somebody else and afforestation is a way that you can do that. OK, Iceland has a goal to create 5% forest cover over the next 50 years. It's a key part of the climate plan as it will help Iceland to achieve their carbon neutral status, which is the plan for 2030. It also helps to protect the soils from wind and water erosion. Now, geothermally heated water is a fundamental part of this strategy because the trees are growing quite quickly in the greenhouses and then the warm water is then used to irrigate the these soils and land which extends the growing season by keeping the soils um, ice and frost free okay um, and as you can see from here over four million trees have been planted since 2015 which is, is quite a lot and then a question here if ash goes over the plants do they die or they get better initially they will sometimes die depends on how much ash goes onto the crops or the plants during that sort of like eruption but what happens is that that then filters down into the soil and then over the next years and I will say years the actual soil will get better okay so it may be that they lose their initial crop but then the following years the crops might be slightly better okay um, so let's look at soils because that is um, quite important all right so as I've said the soils are not yet developed in Iceland, they're quite thin. Um, Iceland is geologically quite new and the majority of soils in Iceland are ander soils. They are volcanic soils. They retain water, but they lack cohesion. So therefore they don't cling together, um, which isn't always good um, for crops. Crops need sort of like soils that kind of cling together. However, on some of the outwash plains of Hecla and Eyjafjallajökull, Yerkel, and on some of the sort of like the, the land that has been isostatically rebounded, so the stuff that used to be under the sea, we're now able to grow potatoes, barley, oats and rapeseed. Um, and these are now quite common crops. The more farming Iceland can do, the better for their economy, because obviously it keeps the living costs a lot lower because they then don't have to import some of what I call the staple crops that they need. And then, of course, another reason why you would want to live in Iceland is because of tourism. And we've already looked at how Iceland's economy is now heavily reliant on the tourism industry. Uh, a question which I think I've already answered about how does a volcanic eruption make the soil fertile? It's all to do with the minerals um, that are within sort of like the ash and the lava. OK, and then that is absorbed into the water and the soil. OK, so let's um, move on. So we've talked about tourism and uh, yeah, I think it is a really, really important part of the economy. And it is a reason why people still live in Iceland. A question that I've quite often seen in exam papers from all the different exam boards. And it's funny because sometimes it gives is nine marks, sometimes it's six, sometimes it's four. You never know, really. I love a nine mark a question. It really gives you the ability to show your knowledge and your understanding and to really show the examiner that you know what you're talking about. OK, in order to get a level three, you really need to think like a geographer here. You need to apply your knowledge use keywords, of course, show that you have the X factor. All right, something a little different to somebody else. It's really important. Now, yesterday I shared quite a lot of model answers and I don't want to do that today, but I just want to sort of like give you some closing thoughts on why quite possibly people might live in Iceland. It's one of the top three happiest places to live. Last year, it's um, 
ranked number two, Norway was number one. It's in the top ranking of the Human Development Index and it's in the top 10 of life expectancy. So obviously it's a good place to live, okay? You have the unrelenting forces of nature, a harsh natural environment, but a very resilient population that has learned to sort of like live within the nature to live within sort of like everything that this country has to offer. They use the natural resources to the best of their ability, yet they are going to be carbon zero. I am I'm confident, having spent a lot of time in Iceland, um, you know, I'm very, very confident that they are gonna be carbon neutral by 2030. They're pretty close to it now, to be honest. They're very progressive, they're very modern. Um, they've got a fantastic education system. Their politics means that they're one of the most democratic and egalitarian societies. Um, and, you know, the fact that they are able to harness these fantastic renewable energy resources is very, very important to them. They have a fantastic optimistic saying, and, and it's one that I've used a lot over the last eight months or so, um, particularly in the last few weeks, I think, called Theta Vedast, which means it will all work out one way or the other. And it's a great philosophy to live with um, as long as you are using the stuff around you to make things better. Um, a couple of questions here. Uh, do they have much migration of young people? No, they don't actually. People do go and um, study abroad quite often because they're quite a forward thinking nation. So therefore they do sort of like use the education um, resources that they get uh, around. People do move to America because they are quite heavily influenced by the Americans because obviously the Americans were quite a big influence on Iceland um, in the 60s and 70s. Sometimes they go to other Scandinavian countries, but there is a lot of sort of like migration into the country as well. Lots of people actually do want to live there and work there. Um, so, you know, I think about 11% of the population at the moment in Iceland actually come from other countries. So, um, so there's a little bit of in and out. Um, which one is the most important? I'm not quite sure what that is relating to. Um, but maybe if you ask that question, which one is the most important, if you could let me know um, what sort of context that is in. And when it rains, does it slightly kill the crops? No, it doesn't, because the concentration of the ash in that rain is actually very, very low. So therefore, it's unlikely to affect the crops um, with the rain. I want to just refer you to a couple of more resources which you might feel are quite important to you and might help you even more with your revision. First of all, we have a 15 minute video by Simon Ross. You might have heard of the name Simon Ross. He writes a lot of textbooks and it might be one of the textbooks that you have in your classroom. He's actually put together a few years ago now, three years ago, a video, a little clip, 15 minutes, fantastic, all about the Aeoflec Yerkel um, case study. So he looks at the causes and the impacts of the eruption, also looks from three years ago, actually, at volcano monitoring and stuff like that. So it might give you some added information to what I've given you tonight, um, although the stuff that I've given you is completely um, sort of like up to date. There's also some additional teaching resources on our website that might be of use to you. Um, the question was, which reason to live in Iceland is the most important? I think that depends on the person, to be honest. I think the reason why I might choose to live in Iceland um, is because of their forward thinking um, culture and the fact that they sort of like work with nature rather than against it. I think that's from my point of view. Um, that's the reason why I might choose to live there. But I think it is very much dependent on the person. And then we have another question. What makes the Icelandic population overcome certain tectonic and weather hazards? I think it's all about resilience. I think they are a very resilient nation, but also they are very well informed. They are very community based. They are very much sort of like on communication um, and they look out for each other. Um, and I think that is what makes them sort of like overcome this. Um, they're also very, very loyal to their country. Um, so therefore they're out to protect their country. They want to live with it. They want to live with the hazards that it, um, that it has. I want to point you to um, two other webinars, which you might find useful. 
which are quite specific and they extend the information that I've given you tonight. So the first one is the challenge of living with natural hazards and it, it does focus on some of the things that I've focused on tonight but in a little bit more detail. So it's a webinar as a standalone webinar all about living with natural hazards and then you can look at our very popular Aeoflec the Yerkel eruption and the impacts 10 years on and again that is a much longer webinar just based on Aeoflec the Yerkel as well um, and that also is quite popular. Okay so just some closing thoughts then. Today we've looked at Iceland as a case study. We've given you quite a lot of information about the background to Iceland. I've crammed in a lot of information in the last 60 minutes and I hope that it's been really useful for you. We've looked at Eoflek Lyerkel at the 2010 eruption. We've looked at the short and long-term responses and the reflections from 10 years on. We've looked at Katla in terms of its monitoring, preparation, planning and prediction. And then we've really looked again at why people continue to live in Iceland. And I hope that it's given you plenty of opportunities um, to add to the case studies that you've done, to maybe look at the revision of stuff that you've done in the classroom already. Um, and if you haven't covered the topic yet, that actually it gives you a great introduction so that you want to learn more. That finishes our webinars for this week. We've got some more revision webinars coming up in November on the 18th and 19th, again at eight o'clock. And we're looking at the challenge of resource management, particularly focusing on energy. We will use Iceland as a case study, but we will also use other countries such as Norway, the Azores and Costa Rica. So please do join us for those um, webinars. Again, sign up in exactly the same way as you did for these webinars, just via our website, and then we will make sure you get the links. If you have any further questions, um, please do email us at Discover the World Education. If you just go onto our website, you'll find our email address there. If you click on me, you'll find my direct email address and that's absolutely fine. And I'll be really happy to answer any other questions you have um, or maybe support you in any extra sort of like research um, and, and work that you want to do on this. In the meantime, be kind to each other, be kind to yourself, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.